On behalf of the Center on Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law at Stanford and our co-sponsors, the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and the Honda Center for Human Rights, uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome you to today's conversation between Kofi Annan and Frank Fukuyama. Um, before I introduce today's speakers, a couple of housekeeping matters. First, we will take questions from the audience today, uh, but we'll be using a note card system. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please f fill out a card, give it to one of the volunteers who will be around in the auditorium, um, and uh, I'll collate them and hand them to Frank, and we're going to have a cutoff of about 12.45 for any questions, so get, so get them in if, if you want to ask a question. Uh, second, please silence uh, all of your cell phones. My name is Steve Stedman, and I'm a senior fellow and a deputy director at the Center on Democracy, Development, and Wor Rule of Law. Uh, normally, my job would be to introduce the introducer of today's event because academic norms calls for bringing in the, the highest of the high officers of the university when the guest is a former Secretary General of the United Nations and winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, in this case, however, I insisted, no, it's okay, I got it. Um, you see, I've been, uh, I've been blessed to work alongside uh, both of today's speakers. Uh, Frank Fukuyama is the Olivier Nomalini Senior Fellow at FSI and the Moss Backer Director of the Center on Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law. Frank is one of the foremost public intellectuals in the world, and his writing is known for taking difficult, sometimes abstruse concepts from political theory and making them accessible to the attentive public worldwide. He is remarkably prolific. Uh, he is what uh, they call in, in unions wage busters. Um, remarkably prolific and is known for his provocative, probing books that examine the fundamental political and social processes that surround us, whether it be The End of History and The Last Man, published in more than 20 languages, or The Origins of Political Order, uh, or uh, Political Order and Political Decay. For this body of work, Frank was awarded the jo Johann Skype Prize for those scholars who have made the most valuable contributions to political science. Today, Frank will be interviewing another individual I have had the honor and privilege of working with closely, twice, uh, while he was Secretary General of the United Nations, and then from 2010 to 2012, uh, as a director of a global commission on elections that he chaired. Kofi Annan is the founder and chairman of the Kofi Annan Foundation, which works for a fairer, more peaceful world through Kofi's convening power and citizen diplomacy in the fields of sustainable development, human rights, and peace and security. Before creating the foundation, Kofi served from 1997 to 2006 as the Secretary General of the United Nations, during which time he and the organization were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. He presided over an organization that many people had written off after peacekeeping failures in Rwanda and Srebrenica. But if one thing marks Kofi's tenure at the UN, it was his relentless effort to make the UN relevant and necessary for the 21st century, improving peacekeeping, strengthening its diplomacy, putting human rights front and center in everything it did, and through the Millennium Development Goals, making the UN central to debates over sustainable development and foreign aid. I could go on, but our time is short. I will say, though, that Kofi and Frank share some characteristics which I've come to know well. They both are excellent listeners who actually want to hear honest criticism. Uh, they are both humane to the core and forge close personal relations with those who work with them. Uh, and they both have a penchant to sp speak their mind, which we'll get to experience for the next hour. Join me in welcoming Kofi Annan and Frank Fukuyama. So Steve, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. I'm really delighted to uh, welcome Kofi Annan to Stanford. It's a tremendous honor uh, to have you here. You're an uh, elder statesman in the global community, a leader uh, that has uh, uh, overseen the development of, of much of our uh, international order. Uh, and that's actually where I want to start. I, I, we're going to get to technology and social media and more specific kinds of issues. But I think we need to set the scene mm -hmm. uh, because that global order uh, that uh, the United Nations and other international organizations are an integral part of, has been built up slowly uh, over many decades since uh, World War II. Uh, it promoted a great deal of prosperity, communication, movement, 
and democracy. Uh, so we had uh, what's been called the third wave of democracy that began in the 1970s and kind of reached a peak uh, back in the mid-2000s. But as our colleague Larry Diamond has pointed out, uh, it's been in recession uh, for a good 10 years at least. And that recession seems to be accelerating uh, with recent elections and uh, you know the rise of some very undemocratic, unliberal forces. So maybe you could uh, give us your take on what's going on in the world. I mean, what, what are these changes and why are they happening? That's a good place to begin. Uh, no, let me, let me say that uh, I'm very happy to be here at Stanford and to meet you and to see Steve, whom I worked with on various occasions. I think the world is in a really messy place today. I recall at the end of the Cold War when the Berlin Wall fell, we were all very excited that finally we can get countries to cooperate. And I was at the UN then, and we felt the UN and the Council can finally do what it was set up to do without the divisions between the two major uh, powers. And it worked. For a while it worked quite well. The Russians cooperated, everybody worked together. The divide came with the Iraq war. So some of the UN will talk about before Iraq and after Iraq. And of course, quite a lot of us at the UN were adamantly opposed to the Iraq war. But the administration was so determined to go to war that not only did it, not, did it not listen to advice, but it attacked anyone who was opposed uh, to the war. Today we have a, a situation, as you point out, we are seeing lots of uh, xenophobia, racism, anti-immigration movements. We are noticing that uh, the populists are taking advantage of all the situation. They are not only taking advantage of it, they are fanning anger, fear, mistrust. And they make loose promises that they cannot fulfill. Somehow, people fall for it. Apart from this, there are changes taking place in our world. I think the world is changing and changing very fast. And I don't think governments and institutions are adapting fast enough to deal with the, with the changes. People feel a bit unmoored that um, things are changing around them. They feel economically they've been left behind. They are not sure their children would do better than they would. And no one is offering them an alternative, nor giving them a vision for the future. Uh, but we've been here before. We were there during, at the end of the Second World War, at the time of the Industrial Revolution. Leaders realized that there were people who fall through the net and set up safety nets to help them and discuss why the safety net. There are, we are almost in that situation today with the changes that are taking place. And those who feel hopeless and despair don't seem to have any hope, and nobody is talking to them. The conversa this conversation is not taking place. And I hope mainstream politicians will have the courage to take on some of these things rather than following the extreme politicians, thinking that's where the votes are. And I think a good example, two good examples, of what happened in Canada with Trudeau. And nobody thought Trudeau would win the elections. He was in third position. He started speaking to the Canadians, frankly, about what he could do, and he won. The second example is France, where everybody was worried about Marie Le Pen and the left, Mélenchon and others. And suddenly, Macron surprises them, forming his uh, uh, en marche movement and talking to the people rationally, telling them the changes and reforms he's going to put through. And he won, mm -hmm. which leads me to believe that people are not as stupid as we sometimes think they are. If you talk to them honestly and you reason with them, 
they will they will go with people who want leadership. They want good leadership, not uh, a leader who thinks it's all about him. Mm-hmm. It has to be about the people. Leadership is service. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure who you're referring to there, but well, uh, <laughs> um, so. I'm interested in your views about the international order itself. Um, you know, we talk about this rules-based, so-called rules-based order uh, in trade, but also in politics. And the United Nations, uh, which you were the Secretary General, was a, a, a key yeah. part of that. Uh, and yet, that those very institutions are really the object of hatred and fury uh, by you know these rising. Uh, populist. The EU is blamed for the migrant crisis and for, uh, you know, the lack of people's connections with their governments. Uh, the United Nations, well, we have a national security advisor that once remarked that, you know, if you lopped off the top 10 floors of the building, nothing, you know, it wouldn't make any difference. Uh, so it's not as if it's getting a lot of respect, you know, from the largest uh, democracy in the United States. Do you I mean, how grave is that threat? I mean, you know, why is this happening right now? And, and what can these institutions do to, you know, defend themselves, uh, much less, you know, move forward? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm happy that uh, your national security advisor is no longer my direct responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> but let me say that there are couple of things institutions can do to protect themselves. Uh, obviously, when you have difficulties at the national level, where people tend to look inward, organizations like the UN and external institutions are a nuisance and a bother for them, because they really want to focus on their nation and what's happening inside. But they often forget that the collective interest is often the national interest, you know, and if you work well at the international level on issues of common, it benefits your country, but they don't always uh, see it that way. When I took over as Secretary General, we were a bit in that situation. The U.S. was not paying its debt. It owed the U.S. over a billion dollars. Senator Jesse Helms was determined that they were not going to pay until the UN bent to his will and did other things. So one of the things I had to do was try and get that money back, try and get them uh, to pay. So I spent quite a bit of time on the hill. I remember President Clinton telling me, I'm doing my best, but Kofi, I need you to help me. So I went to the hill, we talked to people and both senators and congressmen. Uh, Eventually, we got the money. And in fact, it got to a stage, you won't believe this, Jesse Helms invited me to his alma mater to make a speech. And we brought him to the Security Council to make, it was uh, Holbrook, Richard Holbrook brought him to speak at the Security Council. And when we went to his college to speak, there I was on stage, speaking to the audience just like this. And I saw uh, Jesse Helms finding my wife you know, I said, there we go, a southern gentleman, you know, no. Eventually, we got the money, but it was also at that time when uh, Ted Turner came in and gave us a billion dollars. I don't know if some of you know the story. Ted Turner, who was very pro-UN, was very upset that the U.S. was not paying his debt. So we had a joke going. He kept saying, Oh, Kofi, I'm going to buy the debt and flog it for 60 cents in the dollar and give you the money. And we had been joking about this for a couple of years. And one day, I had asked him to come to the office for us to discuss environment, to say, come with your experts. I will have my people there. He walked in and he said, Kofi, I'm going to give you that billion dollars. And I thought he was joking. I look into his eyes and I realize he was serious. <laughs> so I said, would you sit down? And I called my director of management, uh, who had been head of uh, Pricewaterhouse. And we started on and we got the deal. He said, we are going to the dinner at World of tonight and I will announce it. And the lawyers with him said, no, no, you don't give away a billion dollars like that. 
just said, I've, t I've told Kofi I'm going to give it to him and I'm going to announce it. So we went to Waldorf. He spoke very briefly and he said, I'm giving a billion dollars to the UN. I'm ashamed as an American that my government is not paying his debt. And he did. And, and he set out to pay it in 10 installments. And he has on it his uh, uh, commitment. But I also realized that to help the UN, we needed to reach out. That we couldn't sort of make it a club of ambassadors and can. So I decided to reach out to the private sector and, and civil society. When I started opening up, some ambassadors were very upset because they saw the UN as their club, a club of ambassadors. So some even asked me, Mr. Secretary General, who gave you the authority to bring in civil society and the private sector. So I said, Mr. Ambassador, look at your own charter. The charter begins with we, the peoples. The peoples are out there. They are not in this building. We need to reach out and work with them. And also working with them, we expand our capacity. And so that was also part of the approach in, res in uh, fighting back the isolationism mm -hmm. that appeared in some capitals. And in fact, it became so successful that at one time, the current national security advisor said, if the next secretary general comes in and uh, wants to play it the unknown way of going out to civil society and the public and putting pressure on us, we will have difficulties with him. <laughs> Well, that's a good leadership um, lesson. Uh, mm -hmm. If you simply go out and talk to people, uh, uh, the community, civil society, you actually may have some allies on your side. And you, you I, need them. And I you don't need. think there's a politician in the world that you know, can't uh, use a lesson like that. So, so let's uh, talk more specifically about what you've been interested in in terms of democracy and building the strength of democratic institutions. So. Uh, I believe when you were still at the UN, uh, there was a, a, a commission on electoral integrity. This is something that Steve uh, was involved in. So you've obviously been worried uh, about the integrity of democratic institutions for some time, well before the rise of yeah. all the recent events. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested and, and what your concerns were? Uh, I spent quite a bit of time observing what was going on around the world and uh, elections which was supposed to be to help with democratic rotation of leadership. Peaceful rotation of leadership often led to conflict. And uh, I felt that this was a really worrying uh, development and that it was necessary to look at what was wrong. And um, b so we set up this commission in 2012 uh, with Steve leading the process. And basically, we wanted to uh, see what it takes to organize election with integrity, elections which were fair, elections which didn't have too much money floating around, elections which were properly organized and everybody accepted the results as fair. Because we also believed that when you organize elections that are fair with integrity, you confer legitimacy on the winner and the loser also gets some protection. And it should not be a winner takes all situation which leads to tensions and conflict later on. So we set up this global commission on elections, democracy and security and brought in former heads of states and people with considerable experience in this area. In fact, uh, the US featured very much in that report, particularly in the area of uh, uh, campaign financing, because we felt too much money in elections holds out in democracy. And we, so that report was well received. And after the report, all the organizations monitoring elections around the world came to see me at the foundation said, we should do something with this report. So we did not want to set up a new organization. So we created a platform called Election Integrity International. 
and we we meet twice a year to look down the line at elections coming up in the next 24 18 months and identify the ones that are likely to be problematic and determine what we can do to help the situation. Let me give you an example. We looked at Nigeria, the last elections, and we thought it could be difficult. So we organized an event there. We got all the candidates to sign a code of conduct, a code of conduct not to incite violence, to accept the results of the elections, and got them to sign it on television in front of their people. President Buhari signed it, President, former outgoing Jonathan, and they respected the uh, accord. And last year we had three events of that sort in Kuala Lumpur, in uh, Cameroon, and in Mexico City, and we are doing another one in Mexico City. So, But the issues we looked at in 2016, in 2012, have been overtaken by events. We are talking about the impact of social media on elections. All these issues were not even on the radar six years ago. And so we feel we need to reconvene the group to look at the issues of today, the impact of social media on elections, and the fact that um, uh, if you don't handle it properly, when you look at what happened in the States with the alleged interference of the Russians here, if the U.S. is having that much problem protecting its elections, you can imagine smaller countries like mine and, and others. So we are going to look at this to see what the issues are, what recommendations one can come up with that could be helpful uh, for, for all this. Uh, uh, and I hope that we will be able to make some su suggestions. So I'm here uh, uh, talking to people in the industry about uh, impact, the digital impact on elections and how one can protect the integrity of elections. Because if you create the impression that elections can be undermined directly or indirectly by outsiders, in the end, people will lose trust in elections and in democracy. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is driving uh, this situation? So I completely agree that compared to five years ago, yeah. we've seen all this stuff that we really didn't think much about previously. We thought that Facebook and Google and all these big platforms were basically good for democracy because they would bring people together, allow them to mobilize. They played that kind of a role in, you know, the, the, the Orange Revolution in, in Ukraine and in the Arab Spring and uh, a number of other uprisings. Uh, and yet we've seen the weaponization uh, of this uh, by uh, Russia. I actually don't think there's that much dispute about um, uh, the authorship of some of these uh, attacks. Uh, but a lot of it is also spontaneous. I mean, you have very polarized societies like the United States today, and you don't need a bunch of Russians encouraging Americans to go after each other. They're perfectly happy to do it themselves. And in fact, some of the recent research on uh, the, uh, you know, the use of social media in elections suggests that actually it, it tends to focus on people that are converted already, and it, it, you know, it makes them more extreme, but yeah. it doesn't necessarily convert yeah. people that aren't already polarized. So how, would you, how do you understand what the, the problem, the underlying problem is here? Yeah, I, I think, uh, first of all, on, on the last point, I agree entirely with you, this tendency to corral people into uh, silos and feed them information that you, you, you know will reinforce their prejudices and, and, and uh, make it difficult for them to, uh, to work with others. When you have people broken up into silos, you really make political dialogue extremely difficult. And if political dialogue is difficult, you're not going to get compromises either. And really it becomes extremely uh, difficult. I think the other issue is uh, we had all tended to believe that 
social media was a positive thing. Mm-hmm. We forgot to look at the neg- possible, possibly negative aspects of it. I mean, when Arab, some Arab, uh, the Arab Spring occurred, everybody was excited. Here are the young people taking responsibility, getting rid of a dictator. I personally was worried. I was worried that if we t- encourage people to believe that the street is alternative to elections, the street is alternative to parliament, we may pay a price which was not uh, worth it. And in fact, uh, uh, we also failed to understand that the social media that got the young people into the Tahrir Square was a tool and could not organize a revolution by itself. We kept saying, this is a social media revolution. Without leadership, effective leadership, the military eventually took, took power back. And now you have General Sisi, despite the Arab Spring and all that. In 89, 1989, Tinaman Square, the government shut down everything, newspapers, radio, television. But the clever students were communicating with each other through faxes. So we may call the 89 revolution a fax revolution. The Arab Spring Internet Revolution. What would we call the next revolution 20 years from now? What will the tool be? I don't know. But we have to often understand that these are tools, but it does require leadership Mm -hmm. to use it. And we have to understand that it is a tool with positive and negative aspects. And we have to really apply. And this is where there is now talk about regulation. I think regulation is going to be necessary and um, people are generally coming to accept it now. Because when you look back historically, with every new invention, there has been regulation, Mm -hmm. starting with print and press, then radio and television. And I'm afraid the same thing will have to happen to the internet. But the problem is, do you do it nationally or do you come with a system that cuts across and has some international impact? And this is, and of course, if you have an international impact, it will mean agreement amongst countries. Is that going to be easy? I don't think it's going to be easy, but it has to be done. Mm -hmm. And as we go forward, and to my young friends, we will have to answer the question, is the social media an instrument for emancipation and empowerment or one of control and who wields that control. So this is just an observation on that issue that seems to me that the the bad actors in the world are actually using social media for different purposes. Mm -hmm. So some people want to use it for control. I think the Chinese are developing this uh, uh, you know this this system of monitoring virtually every transaction that all of their more than a billion you know citizens engage in and uh, keeping tabs on them and and using it you know uh, uh, using AI and, and machine learning to actually control their citizens. But there's another uh, use which the Russians have specialized in, which is not to control people. They don't want to project a positive image of Russia the way old Soviet propaganda did. Uh, what they basically want to do is simply sow distrust. Mm-hmm. And so they don't care really yeah. what form the distrust takes. So maybe they're going to support Donald Trump and conspiracy theories on the right, but they're also going to push Black Lives Matter and you know progressive causes. The only thing they care about is whether Americans are more polarized and more yeah. distrustful of one another. So I would say that you know we have a couple of distinct yeah. problems and it's probably a lot easier to do the spreading of distrust and and dissolving the the, the faith in your institutions more than actually controlling people although that's obviously something that yeah. other countries are doing yeah no uh, that's a problem i noticed that even in uk they are saying uh, the russians were involved with the election last year where Corbyn almost won, that mm-hmm. they supported Corbyn with bots and other things. And of course, uh, we also should be careful 
because I think today we say the Russians are doing it, but it won't be very long that others, other players will be doing the same thing. So we have to find out how we protect ourselves from that, that sort of uh, behavior mm -hmm. because uh, people learn very fast. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit more about this question of how does society control these problems that uh, we are now very much aware of. And it seems to me that, uh, as you suggested, there are several ways of getting at this. So the one that I think all of the platforms here in Silicon Valley would prefer is some form of self-regulation. Uh, then there's the next higher level, which is some form of national regulation. Mm -hmm. So doing this out of Washington or in Europe, it would be out of Brussels or, you know, locally every country is now developing a internet regulator. And then there's the international level. So let's talk about each of those at um, uh, sequentially. Uh, I, I guess I can put this to you very simply. Do you trust uh, Facebook and Google and Twitter and these other big internet platforms to self-regulate? Is that, is that an adequate approach? I don't think they can be uh, allowed to self-regulate. They are so, uh, too important in society and too important for all of us to allow them to self-regulate. Uh, um, I think they can claim the right and the ability to self-regulate if they have done some of the things they are now being asked to do already by themselves. So that when you raise the question of, we want you to do this and that and that. If they had can come to Congress or come here, say we've already done it. We anticipated. We knew the problems. Then you know they are showing responsibility, and that you can encourage them to carry on with it. Uh, but that is not the the case. I mean, when you look at the some of the events that we've lived recently, and so I think some form of national regulation is necessary. But I would encourage the companies to cooperate and work with government and other stakeholders to come up with a, a regulation that will allow them to perform, but also protect society and the rights of the individual. You cannot have the big data. You cannot do micro-targeting. You cannot uh, have all this information on people whose information is it. What happens to privacy of the individual? What happens to the consent of the, the, the whole host of issues? Luckily, I'm looking at the election side and I'm not dealing with these issues, but it is of concern. Mm -hmm. Let's take a specific case uh, that you are quite familiar with, which is Myanmar. So Facebook has been involved in a big controversy recently because They've been accused of facilitating some of the killings going on in Rakhine State with the Rohingya uh, and so forth. So you've been acting as a, you know, as an international uh, mediator in that. Do you think they're blamable? And, and do you think that they yeah, have think, stepped up to the responsibility they have uh, as a global platform? Yeah. I think it's, 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 it's quite amazing how in some of these countries, uh, Internet has really been able to penetrate. I mean, I was in Myanmar working on the advisory commission on Rakhine State to make recommendations to Aung San Suu Kyi and the government. And um, the sort of messaging that went of, in fairness, it was in Burmese, the Burmese messages really fueling anger, hatred, and protecting the tribalism that was there. And of course, we saw what happened in the end with over 700,000 people uh, being uh, 700,000 being pushed out. Could Facebook have done anything? I don't know. But I raise a question. Could they have uh, cut them off if they were aware? And if they uh, were not aware and didn't have capacity on the ground, could they have sent in a, a rapid response, a task force, to go and see what is happening on the ground, affecting so many lives, and take action? 
these are some of the issues one mm-hmm. will have to look at and discuss. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I suspect that that is a capacity that Facebook has not uh, developed. I'm exactly. not sure their local office in Rakhine State is really up to the task of making these kinds of complex yeah. uh, political judgments. And See, in some countries, uh, the government itself closes it down completely, which is also sometimes leads to abuse. Um, uh, they will close it down when you criticize the government. Mm-hmm. But they will not close it down when you are criticizing a group that that comes under pressure. Mm-hmm. And so the, the local government should also have some responsibility. Right. Uh, so if you move then to the next level of national regulation, um, I think that's really going to come from Europe. I don't see it coming initially from Washington. So there's a GDPI, the General Data Protection um, uh, Initiative from from Brussels. Uh, there's a German Facebook law that is extremely punitive. You know, fifty million dollar or a million euro fine for uh, publishing fake news. Uh, how do you think that's going to work out? I mean, do you support that kind of um, uh, what some people would say is heavy-handed regulation that probably is going to be a damper on free speech and you know the open use of these platforms? Yeah, I, I think it, it it ought to be possible to come up with effective regulation without undermining uh, free speech. One has to be conscious. You have to be careful that the uh, the solution is not worse than the problem. And, and, and so the, uh, we, we, we should be sensitive. But at the same time, you need to come up with effective regulation on, on, on this control. There is real worry of what people can do when you are on the... For example, the Germans don't allow machines in any phase of their elections. Last year, the Dutch did their whole elections by hand because they were worried. You know, and so we need to find ways of dealing with this. So, um, so I want to just ask, talk about two more topics, and then uh, uh, we'll turn to the questions that have come from the okay. uh, audience. Um, in all of this talk about how to deal with the internet, uh, international institutions haven't been very important. So it may be the mm-hmm. Europeans or Washington or something like that. Do you think that uh, the international system itself has a role to play in, in all of this? They should have a role to, uh, to play because it's so we are so interconnected now. And uh, we are dealing with an instrument that is transnational and cuts across all borders. And we have to have a way of... Uh, uh, if not controlling it, of cooperating with each other. I know people often don't realize how um, the UN, you refer to the UN, is in their lives every day. And without the UN, life will become very complicated. UN and its agencies. I mean, when you talk of uh, ITU on, on radio frequencies and all that, they regulate it. You have intellectual property in Geneva, which regulates uh, copyrights issues. You have ICAO, which regulates frequency for airlines, World Health Organization, which says, so it goes on and on. And in the past, we've accepted the sort of international cooperation without any problems. But it has been difficult to get that cooperation on internet. Our Secretary General, I set up a task force 16 years ago to look at this issue, saying that it's becoming so important that many countries will not allow the control of internet to be in the hands of ICANN, an American NGO. So let's get together and find a way. Uh, Washington wasn't very keen. We didn't go very far, but I was sure that over time, China, India, Brazil, and others wouldn't accept this. And we need to really do something about it before it gets out of hand. Right. Uh, 
One of my favorite international organizations is the ISO, the International Standards Organization. Uh, most people don't know what the hell it is, but uh, it's extremely important uh, to everybody because it's what establishes international standards. It's largely a technical body that has not been politicized, but I think as an example of one of the challenges, there is recently an article saying that they're trying to come up with standards for blockchain, and the Russian delegation shows up, and they're all... FSB people or people with a background in intelligence yeah. and security and they want Russian algorithms to be used in you know setting the international standards and so I think we're in for a lot of it's a good example yeah. okay so the last I can't uh, resist asking you this uh, which is to talk a little bit about the United States and what you think what the hell is going on in our country uh, because um, obviously in terms of global democracy and the prestige of countries that hold free and fair elections. The United States has always been, uh, you know, the beacon of hope for a lot of people. It's played a direct role in establishing this, this uh, global post-World War II uh, mm. order. And yet you find Americans questioning the legitimacy of their own elections and, and, and so forth. So yeah. what's, what's happening? Let me say that uh, outsiders do not understand you. <laughs> They don't understand what is uh, happening. These are friends of the U.S., people who have a great deal of affection for U.S. and have accepted U.S. leadership. They are worried that the U.S. is losing the moral and the political high ground that it has occupied over the years. And it earned that position because of the contribution this has made uh, particularly since the Second World War, helped them build the global architecture, uh, which includes the UN, the World Bank, IMF, and others. But today, it seems to be keen on dismantling the system that is self uh, uh, built together and is creating the impression that um, it will not assume the responsibilities that it had in the past. When you hear Merkel, for example, say Europe has to look after its own interests and itself, and she speaks for lots of leaders when she says uh, that. And also, signals coming out of Washington is confusing. <laughs> yeah. uh, people do not understand the position of Washington. Uh, the president is unpredictable and they don't know whether the tweet is a policy or something else is going to come out after the tweet. And this is uh, unsettling. Uh, when you sign an agreement on the Iranian nuclear deal with all the partners and the president comes in and says, I'm walking away uh, from it. But at the same time, I'm going to make a deal with the North Koreans. Why would the North Koreans make a deal with a man who can treat that deal the same way he's treating the Iranian deal? What incentive do they have to make a deal? I heard on radio or television where the president thinks that approach is positive and it forces the North Koreans to make a deal. Mm -hmm. I don't see it that way. I would hope that uh, the pendulum will swing back uh, to the reasonable middle. Uh, but for the moment, we are all worried. We are all worried. And as, as I said earlier, the world is a messy place. And when you live in a messy environment, you need effective leadership. You need wise and sound judgment. And um, I'm not sure today I can say we have it. Well, I would say a lot of Americans are worried also uh, about the future of our role in the world and our own um, uh, institutions. So I think that's a shared concern. Okay, so uh, I'm going to turn to some of the questions from the audience. Uh, I uh, think a lot of students have s suggested them. So let's start with this one, which I think is actually quite a good 
question. Is it right, in your opinion, to use international institutions like the United Nations to promote or impose democracy on every nation in the world? Do you think liberal democracy is a viable form of government in every country, and um, why or why not? First of all, I don't think democracy or any political system can be imposed. It has to be homegrown. People have to adapt it to their own situations as long as they respect the basic principles of uh, freedom of speech, the rule of law. And I personally have always maintained that healthy democracies are built on three pillars, uh, peace and stability, inclusive development, and, and rule of law and respect for human rights. And that honestly, no country can develop without stability. And you cannot have stability without inclusive development. But both have to be rooted in the rule of law and respect for uh, human rights. I don't think the UN or any institution or any government can go around imposing a system on other people and other countries. They can do it by remembering the basics that they need to respect. Um, that's a very, I mean, I agree with that answer completely. I think, you know, the Chinese would say we have a different set of cultural values in which rule of law and human rights we simply don't understand the same way. Uh, and they're a very big and powerful player. So how do you reconcile these positions? Yes, yes. Um, and and uh, if you try to impose uh, your will on them, you are pushing for confrontation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you've begun to answer this question already, but uh, there's a question about uh, what's driving this rise of illiberal democracies uh, around the world? You know, countries like now Poland and Hungary or Turkey or the Philippines. Uh, unfortunately, we have quite a lot of examples of this where you have some degree of democratic legitimacy, but they're not liberal in the sense of wanting to protect individual rights rule of law. Why all of a sudden? Why in you know the middle of the second decade of the 21st century? Yeah. I think this is happening in... For, uh, there are various reasons in various countries. Uh, in, in Eastern Europe, they've all, uh, exploited the migration issue to a great extent. Uh, urban in Hungary really exploited this uh, to take power and to win election the third term uh, and of course people are also unhappy sometimes because of the economic conditions and the sense that those in power are not paying attention to their needs and I always believe that even when politicians and leaders do not have immediate solutions if they were to engage the people and tell them we have a plan we are going to take care of you, and this is what we are going to do, and speak to them honestly. The people will not despair as much and, and fall prey to the populist who come and promise, lo make loose promises and, and win the elections. Uh, you have a similar situation in Poland where Kaczynski is not in parliament, he's leader of the party, but calling the shots, which is unheard of in a, uh, normally in a democratic or semi-democratic institutions. And, and then you see it in the third world where some leaders come in and are able to do better economically mm -hmm. and they become God. It was, uh, I think it was Gandhi who said, for those who are starving, God does appear only in the form of bread, you know, and and, uh, uh, and, and I, I really hope that uh, mainstream politicians will lead. I have often said, and I have lots of young people here, that uh, when leaders fail to lead, the people could lead and make them follow. And in a way, we had an in, you had an interesting example here, when they and also telling them you are never too young to lead, 
So I was very excited to see those young students after the shooting in Florida, organizing themselves mm -hmm. and going to Washington. That is what young people, you, you should lead. You should take action when my generation uh, fails. So I, I thought that was a wonderful example and I hope they keep it up. No, I think that was uh, uh, inspiring. Uh, it's also interesting the number of people that are running for office now because they realize that uh, you can't take elections for granted and you can't take good results of elections for granted unless good people are running. If I could just um, follow up a little bit on that illiberal democracy question. Uh, a lot of it is obviously driven by immigration, refugees, you know, mm -hmm. this interconnected set of issues. Now, Angela Merkel, in response to the flood of over a million refugees showing up in Europe after the, in the wake of the Syrian civil war, uh, was exercising leadership. I mean, she took a huge political risk uh, by saying, given Germany's history, we want to demonstrate that we're, you know, we're a different country right now and we're going to do everything uh, it takes to open our doors to these people. And yet this has triggered this massive backlash. So there's the AFD, this, this populist party, new populist party in Germany. Uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, it, it was an open invitation to people like Orban and Kaczynski to say that, you know, these international uh, liberal elites want to flood our countries with, you know, non-Europeans and so forth. So do you think that that was an example of, you know, visionary leadership or was it, was it a mistake? I think it was an example of visionary leadership. I think down the line, people are going to see the advantages of what, first of all, you cannot stop migration. What we need to do is to manage migration effectively manage it in the interest of the country of origin, country of transit, and country of final destination. But above all, in the interest of the migrant, migration has been going on from time immemorial, and it will continue. And so we need to find ways of managing them. And when they come into a country, as part of uh, settling them in, I hope they would also be allowed to work. The often is the able-bodied people, the, the adventurers, the ambitious who leave. And when they come in and they are put into camps or homes and they are not allowed to work, it provokes the local population. It's my tax money which is being used to keep these people who are younger than me, as fit as I am, and they are not working. I think uh, Merkel did the right thing. And besides, all these countries are going to need migrants to be able to maintain their economic level. Germany will need to bring in thousands of migrants uh, in the next five, ten years going forward. And, 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 and uh, they will look back one day on this and thank Merkel for what she did. It was a courageous decision. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, she was perhaps the only one in Europe who could have taken that decision, and I'm very proud of her that she did. And besides, she was a woman. A man would have been more cautious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> uh, yes, we need female leaders to take these bold steps. Uh, so um, this then gets to another question that was asked, which will open up a really big further set of questions, which was the cause of this migrant crisis, which was Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking back at the Syrian civil war, how do you analyze uh, the role of the international community and the major actors within it? What should we have done differently to prevent this horrible outcome? You know, 400,000 at least people killed, you know, uh, millions and millions mm -hmm. of people displaced either within mm -hmm. Syria or migrants to other countries, destabilizing, you know, Turkey, Jordan, Iraq. Uh, um, uh, Lebanon and the knock-on effects in Europe. Yeah. So walk us through you yeah. know, how we got to where we are and what we could have done differently. I think the, the international community has failed Syria. It has failed Syria because uh, of the divisions within that community. Um, you may recall that I was a special envoy 
uh, in, in 2012 for a, for a while. When I took the job, I told the council members, this is a difficult job, but I think we can make a contribution, we can make a difference if we work together and if you stay together as a council. In the early stages, they were able to pass some resolutions collectively because when the council speaks with one voice, it has an impact. It's not just form, it's also substance. And so one of the things I tried to do as an envoy was to try and bring everybody uh, together. And when you look at the Geneva communique at the end of June 2012, the key paragraph in that communique they signed, and I got everybody to sign, Lavrov, Hillary Clinton, all the foreign ministers, was uh, to indicate that what was required was a transitional government with full executive authority. Why was that paragraph so important? Because at, at, at that point, the West was saying Assad must go. The Russians were saying Assad goes and then what? Uh, honestly, in some ways, the Russians did very good analysis. Not only did I discuss this with Lavrov in Geneva, but I went to Moscow to talk to Putin and his group and then had a tete-a-tete -a -tete with him. He said, well, if Assad were to go today, let's say we agreed and he left, then what? We don't want a chaotic co collapse of Syria. That if you have a co chaotic collapse and there's nothing to build on, the terrorists will spread all over the place and come as far as our area. So by suggesting a transition period, whether it was 12 months or 18 months, you gave them time to work out their differences and agree on at what time they will work for change in government. And basically, what I was trying to do was to encourage them to have their Westphalia moment. After the 30-year war in Europe, the Europeans met in Westphalia and came up with the Treaty of West and stopped killing each other. And I believe then and even now that Middle East needs this Westphalia moment. S Syrians cannot resolve it alone. The region is too divided with Iran, Saudi Arabia and others. So you need the international, regional and the Syrians to have a, make a common cause, have a common framework to be able to resolve this. We are far away from that. Uh, but if you don't do that, I don't see uh, the end of the war. So President Obama was heavily criticized uh, by you know, people that were serious foreign policy commentators for not uh, having used American power more forcefully. I mean, the obvious case was you know, the chemical weapons red line where he, he stood down uh, and blame him uh, for the kind of uh, you know, mess that allowed the Russians then to intervene and the Iranians and so forth. Uh, do you think it would have been better if the United States had taken a more forceful position, including the use of hard power uh, earlier in the conflict? First of all, I don't think there's any military solution to the crisis. It has to be political. Uh, look at Iraq. U.S. took a forceful position. Was a result. Uh, look at Libya. The West took a forceful position, and we know the the result. What is required? When I was in, it became very clear to me that there was no military solution, and neither side had the power to give a knockout punch, and that one needed to find a way of getting them to resolve the issue. Uh, politically. No, it, it is easy to use a uh, uh, military force. You know, going back to Iraq, a Tunisian minister who was the last person to see Saddam before the war, he had gone there to try and convince Saddam to give up and uh, go somewhere else. Saddam said, where do I go? And he said, you're going to lose a war. You will. And Saddam said, yes, I will lose a war. Let the Americans come, but we shall see how they get out. 
And we saw the con he he didn't know what Saddam meant. When he mentioned this to me, so Saddam said, let them come and we'll see how they get out. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's, a, that's a good observation. It's much easier to get into wars than to extract yourself from them. So uh, there's a couple of questions uh, specifically about the Rohingya. Uh, you've already talked about that to some extent. So I guess the real question then would be, what now? So what does the international community do? Is In there Syria. No, no, I'm sorry, we're in, in Myanmar. Myanmar, Shif yeah. We're shifting to your other yeah, yeah, special yeah, my envoy other role. Uh, yeah. I mean, is there something that, you know, yeah. going forward uh, we yeah. can do to help the plight of these yeah. people? I, I, yeah, actually the Security Council is in Myanmar now. They went to Cox's Bazaar in uh, Bangladesh and, and Myanmar. I, I, it would be interesting to see what they come back with. But I think what the international community now has to do is to work with the governments of Myanmar and Bangladesh in getting the refugees back. Because you have uh, almost a million people in Cox's Bazaar who cannot go back at the moment because they are not sure of their security and they have no resettlement prospects. And Bangladesh has been very generous, but for how long? We are now getting into the monsoon season and we've all seen the fragile accommodation that they have. So it's going to be very, very chaotic and very dangerous leading to diseases if we are not. What I would want to see is the international community, now that the council is there, working with the two governments to ensure security in Myanmar and getting them to open up so that humanitarian agencies, the press, can go back. And if there's international presence, I think the Rohingyas would want to go back. Without that, I don't think they will go back and then trust their lives in, into the hands of the people who have chased them out. So the international community should continue supporting them in Bangladesh where they are, put pressure on the Myanmar government, particularly the military, to prepare the ground for their return and assure their security. And do you think there's any chance the military would accept them back? I think it depends on the uh, level of, of pressure that, that they come under. It will not be easy. It will not be easy. They will uh, resist. But if, if it's collective and sustained pressure, and by collective, I think one should also try and get the Chinese and the Indians also involved. It shouldn't just be Western pressure. Uh, both India and China are neighbors. They share borders with Myanmar and they have interest and influence here. So one should try and pull them in as well. Okay, we have um, three more questions. So one of them uh, says the following. Some say that a new Cold War is in the offing. Uh, in your view, is it? Uh, and if not, how likely is it? And I guess we could actually have a couple of Cold Wars because, you know, you've got the U.S.-Russia, you've got the U.S.-China. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I think the atmosphere today reminds us a bit of the, of the Cold War, uh, uh, particularly between Washington and Moscow and given the language which is also used. Uh, and I, I must say, as somebody who spent quite a, lot, a bit of his life in the diplomatic world, the language which is used these days uh, is, is un unbelievable. You know, I, I was telling the press, when you hear the press saying, we are trying to make sense out of all this noise. You know, normally when you hear noise, you think it's coming from the streets. But they are talking of noises coming from governmental headquarters, coming from leaders, and that is worrying, you know, uh, and threats and counter threats, you know, it is worrying. And you see what's happening in Syria. It's a very, relatively small territory, military theater with so many actors, so many fighters. All that you need is a miscalculation or a mistake and all best could be off. Uh, 
I don't think we are quite there yet, but we are moving towards another uh, Cold War. And this time, the world is much more complicated because, as you say, you have a powerful China, a confident and secure under President Xi, which is asserting uh, itself. And when you look back, the Chinese have been very patient and also picked their timing. I recall a Secretary General talking to the Chinese leadership and telling them to send us some of their brilliant uh, people said, no, no, not yet, or asking them to play a certain role. So we are a third world country, we are a poor country, G77, we are not going to do this. About 13, 15 years ago in Beijing, they told me, Mr. Secretary General, we will be sending out brilliant young ambassadors and diplomats, and you will see. And they've done that. Mm -hmm. They, are, they now have decided it's time for them to assert their leadership. They held back, they were patient until they were ready, which is also uh, say something about their, uh, their leadership. So when you have a confident China asserting itself and a Cold War between US and uh, uh, Russia, and China and Russia becoming a bit more chummy, you have a complicated world to deal with. Yeah. It's a very uh, tricky world for the United States uh, to navigate uh, because in the Cold War itself, you know, the United States was still in many ways the dominant economic power, but getting used to a world in which that's no longer true I think is going to be difficult. All right, two more questions. Uh, this goes back to the UN. If you were Secretary General of the UN today, what would you want to do to improve the impact and relevance uh, of the UN uh, for the world? I will first of all uh, start by explaining the importance of the UN to the people, we the peoples. If you do it right and you also begin to work with the governments, you have allies, they are people, and they should be able to help you put pressure on the leaders to understand that the collective interest may also be the national interest and that there are issues today that no country, however powerful, can resolve alone, from climate change to terrorism to even issues of migration that we've talked about and that you need to work uh, together. We also, I would also want to reach out a bit further to the private sector that we worked with. And, and they can do things which uh, uh, I did talk about uh, Tetana giving us money, but what I, uh, the private sector did HIV AIDS was a very interesting thing. When I set up the global fund to fight HIV AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis, I had hoped that apart from governments, individuals would also put in money. In fact, the first check into the fund came from me. I had won a prize of $100,000. I endorsed it and put it in the fund to encourage individuals to, uh, to uh, do it. The private sector didn't put in money, but when HIV AIDS continued to kill people, I invited seven chairmen of the biggest pharmaceutical companies for a meeting in Amsterdam. And I asked them that I needed their help. I wanted them to reduce the cost of medication so that the poor could afford it. And I shared with them, I said, sometimes Nan and I, my wife, was, we visit clinics in villages. And the person lying there looks at you in a way, asking a question without saying a word, almost saying, I know there is a medication that can save me, but because I'm poor, this disease has become a death sentence. So I asked them to reduce the medication, the cost. The first chairman who spoke 
said, I, I, I don't even know why I came to this meeting. I could be accused of price fixing. And I said, uh, price fixing is when you collude to maximize your profits. Here I'm asking you to cut price. I'm asking you to lose money. Who is going to uh, take you to court? And at that time, they were suing Mandela in a South African court because he had threatened to use um, general license to produce the um, generic version of the medication for his population. And I said, I'm not a public relations man, but if you go and sue Mandela in a South African court on an issue like HIV AIDS, if you lose, you lose. If you win, you lose and lose and lose. So you better take it out of court and settle. And that's what they did. In the end, they did reduce the medication quite considerably. Medication like Neverapin to prevent mother-to-child transmission. They were given it free in Botswana and other places. So they made a contribution. And there are other areas in the environment where they can do things. And so we should work with the people in the private mm -hmm. sector and the governments. I think if anybody doesn't uh, believe that the international community can actually do something, they're simply not aware of what's been going on in global health and the yeah. just unbelievable contributions that the international community has made uh, in that sphere. Okay, the last question, actually, uh, two of them ask the same thing. There's a lot of students in this audience. They're very idealistic. Uh, they really want to make the world a more peaceful, prosperous, uh, open place. Uh, and so the question to you is, what advice do you have for them? I mean, where do they get involved? Uh, you know, your, your foundation, the UN, yeah. uh, uh, their governments, uh, how, what would, advice would you give them? Yeah. F first of all, I will suggest that it starts in your community. To be a good global citizen it starts in your university, your community, when you see something wrong, don't walk past. Don't be a, a, a third party standing by unconcerned. It may be something as simple as seeing somebody being bullied. And for you to say, stop, this is enough. You have no idea the courage it gives a victim to fight back and what you do. Often when we ask young people to make a contribution, they think, we want them to go and resolve something as big as Syria or some. It, it doesn't have to be that way. I often come across young people who ask me, what do I do to become a leader? And I ask them, tell me, what are you doing with your time? What did you do last summer? I was at Beijing University talking to young people and one of them said, I go and teach villagers, children, who haven't had the opportunity we have to teach them mathematics or to do this and to help them. The other ones told me what they were doing. They were all leaders, but they didn't know. I said, you know, you're already a leader. Keep it up. And uh, I, I would want to tell you, you are never too young to lead. Don't let my generation tell you, shut up and wait your turn. If there's something that you feel you can do something about, do it. We, it, you, it will be recognized. And I would also say that you should reach out to each other, work together, respect each other, work across racial, religious, and other lines, and um, don't accept the divisions that sometimes you see in your society. And above all, you should listen. And if you're going to become a leader, you have to listen, you have to observe, and you also have to follow. A good leader has to be a good follower. And as I said earlier, it's not all about the individual. It's about the group. It's about serving the people you want to lead. Don't believe those leaders we think they have to show how tough they are by using that language which sometimes embarrasses children. Thank you. Okay, so you have your instructions and you have your inspiration. Kofi Annan, thank you very, very much for... Thank you.
terrific conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you.